that's the next question, that your Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is he physically dead or alive? And we have to agree, physically Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa dead, he's buried in Medina. Is Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is he physically dead or alive? We have to agree that he's alive. The Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 158, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has raised him up alive. So who's greater? A prophet who's dead is greater or a prophet who's alive is greater? They ask the question, but they don't give you the reply. They let your mind think. They use as Muslims as punching bags, as dough mats, and we can't even open our mouth. See, doing dawa is very easy. If you read the Quran with understanding, and if you keep your mind open, doing dawa is very easy. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, Kul, ya hilal kitab. Say, O people of the book, Ta'alo ila kalmitin sawa imbarina bainakum. Come to common terms, as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah, na'buda illallah. That we worship men but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi shayyam. That we associate no partners with him. Wala yattakhiza baad dun abad dun arbaban min dun illa. That we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Fainta wallah. If then they turn back. Fakulu shadu. Say, be witness. We are not Muslimun. That we are Muslims bowing away to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This verse of the glorious Quran, Surah Al-Imran, Chapter number three, verse number 64, according to me, is the master key as far as dawa to non muslim is concerned. Is the master key for dawa. It says, Ta'alo ila kalmitin sawa bainakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bhi shayyam. That we associate no partners with him. And if you see, the tapes and the lectures that I have given, all these questions have been answered. How to dawa has been explained. It's so easy, the only thing you have to do is open your mouth. The non Muslim society can be divided into further three categories. One is the category who is religious. There are in the non Muslim society, in the Western society, there are since majority are Christians, there is a small percentage who are religious. They are Christians and they follow the scripture, the Bible. In other societies like in India, where majority are Hindus, there is a small portion, a small percentage of Hindus who are religious, who follow the scriptures. The best way to dawah with these people is, Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa imbaina bainakum. Come to common terms as we us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'abda illallah, that we worship none but Allah. We have to speak from their scriptures, trying to prove about one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The best thing about dawa, the most important aspect is proving about oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All the other aspects are secondary. If you cannot convince a non-Muslim about tawheed, about monotheism, it is useless. You may speak to him about other aspects of Islam, but if he yet continues doing shirk, it will never be forgiven. Shirk is the biggest sin in Islam, which Allah will never forgive, unless he repents before death. And this way how to do dawah, based on the verse of the Quran, I have dealt in various of my talks, similarities between Islam and Christianity, similarities between Islam and Hinduism, and how to do dawah. For example, living in the western country where the majority claim to be christians though a small percentage are religious in bridging the gaps with the christians i've given the talk on similarities between islam and christianity where i mentioned there that islam is the only non-christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in jesus christ peace be upon him we believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe that he was the Messiah, translated Christ. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention, which many modern day Christians today do not believe. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. The Christians and the Muslims, we are going together. But one may ask, 
Then where is the parting of ways? The parting of ways is there are many Christians who say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he claimed divinity. He said that he was Almighty God. In fact, if you read the Bible, there is not a single unequivocal statement. In the complete Bible, there is not a single unambiguous statement. In the complete Bible, where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God, or where he says, worship me. I am a student of Islam and compiled religion, and I read the Bible. There is not a single unequivocal statement, not a single unambiguous statement. In the complete Bible, where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God, or where he says, worship me. In fact, if you read the Bible, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself said, that my father is greater than I. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, my father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, I cast out devils with the Spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20, I with the finger of God cast out devils. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just, for I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Anyone who says, I seek not my will, but the will of Almighty God, he's a Muslim. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is a Muslim. And it's clearly mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 22, that ye men of Israel, listen to this, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles, which God did by him, and you are witness to it. A man approved of God amongst you by wonders and signs and miracles, which God did by him, and you are witness to it. So if we read the scriptures, we can prove from their scripture that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he never claimed divinity. He was the messenger of Almighty God. We can prove from the Bible about the coming, about the advent, about the prophecy of the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You can give a talk on that. It's mentioned in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 18. In the book of Isaiah, chapter number 29, verse number 12. In the Song of Solomon, chapter number 5, verse number 16. In the New Testament, in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 16. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 15, verse number 26. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 7. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14. You can only go on giving references from the Bible where the prophecy of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is mentioned. Time doesn't permit us to talk about these aspects. You can refer to my video cassette on similarities between Islam and Christianity or Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in the Bible. Similarly, if you're living in a non-Muslim society where you have Hindus, you can come to common terms as far as their scripture is concerned and our scripture is concerned. If you're living with Buddhists, it's the same. If you're living with Jews, it's the same technique. So this is as far as one category of non-Muslim is concerned, those who are religious. In today's world, especially the Western world, though people claim to be Christians, very few are actually practicing Christians. They are more impressed with science and technology, and most of them, practically, they are atheists. They do not believe in God. So how will you do to them? If I meet an atheist, and if he tells me that there is no God, the first thing I'll do is, I will congratulate him. You will wonder, why is Zakir congratulating an atheist? The reason I will congratulate an atheist is because most of the non-Muslims, they are non-Muslims because of the parents. Most of the human beings, they follow their parents blindly. He's a Christian, because father is a Christian. He's a Hindu because father is a Hindu. Many Muslims are Muslim because their fathers are Muslim. This atheist is thinking. His parents may be religious, but he's thinking. He does not agree in the gods which the parents worship. So he says there's no God. And the reason I congratulate the atheist is because 
he has said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, La ilaha, there is no God. So half my job is done. The only thing I have to do is illallah, which I shall do inshallah. See, the atheist, as I told you, Sulaiman Al Imran chapter 3 verse 64 is the master key for Dawa. Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa imbayna baynakum. Come to common terms, I have been us and you. There are many Muslims who ask me that what is the commonality between the atheist and the Muslim? I said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, la ilaha. There is no God. Because half my job is done. To another non-Muslim who believes in a God, first I have to prove to him that the God is worshipping is wrong. And then I have to talk to him about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here, half my job is done. He has already said la ilaha, there is no God. Only thing I have to do is illallah, which I shall do inshallah. Now most of these atheists, as I told you, they have become atheists because they believe in science and technology, which they feel is so advanced, and they become atheists. And after congratulating him, I ask him a question. That, suppose there is an equipment, there's an object, which no one in the world has ever seen, no human being has seen, if it is brought in front of you, and if the question is asked, that who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this equipment, of this object. If I ask this question to an atheist, that an object or an equipment which no human being has ever seen in this world, if it's brought in front of that atheist, and if he is asked the question, that who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this equipment, what reply can he give you? What reply can he give you? Creator, manufacturer, some may say creator, some may say manufacturer, some may say producer, some will say inventor, whatever they say, it will be somewhat similar, just keep it at the back of the mind. Either the atheist will tell you a creator, a manufacturer, a producer, an inventor, it will be somewhat similar, or maker, keep it at the back of the mind and continue. Ask him the next question. That how did this universe come into existence? So the atheist will tell you that we have come to know that initially our whole universe was one primary nebula. Later on, there was a secondary separation, a big bang, which gave rise to galaxies, the stars, the planets, the sun, and the earth on which we live. This they call as the big bang. If you ask the question to atheists, when did you come to know about this big bang? He will tell you, 30 years back, 40 years back, we came to know how the universe came into existence in the big bang. You ask him the question. What you're talking about, the Big Bang, is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30. Do not the unbelievers see the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. What you're talking about, the Big Bang, is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 1400 years ago? The atheist may say, maybe it's a fluke. Don't argue. You have to ask me the next question. That what is the shape of this earth on which we live? So he will tell you that previously the human beings, they believed that the earth was flat. It was in 1577, it's a Francis Drake, he sailed around the earth that he proved that the earth was spherical. You ask him the question, the Quran mentions the spherical shape of the earth 1400 years ago, in Surah Naziyat, chapter number 79, verse number 30, where Allah says, Wal ard baad azalika dahaha. And thereafter, we have made the earth egg shape. The earth we live in is not completely round like a ball. It is geospherical shape. It is flattened from the poles. And the egg that is referred in the Quran, dahaha, one of its meanings is an expanse. One of the meanings is an egg. It specifically refers to the egg of an ostrich. And if you analyze the shape of the egg of an ostrich, that too is geospherical in shape. Imagine, the Quran speaks about the geospherical shape of the earth 1400 years ago. You ask the question to the atheist, that who could have mentioned this in the Quran? We will tell you, oh, maybe your prophet Muhammad was an intelligent man. Don't argue, continue. You ask him the next question, that the light of the moon, is it its own light or reflected light? So he will tell you, previously we thought that the light of the moon was its own light. 
Recently, we have come to know that the light of the moon is not its own light, but it is a reflected light of the sun. Yesterday in science means 40 years back, 50 years back, 100 years back. Quran mentions 1400 years ago in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61, that blessed is he who has made the constellations in the skies and placed therein sun having a light of its own and moon having borrowed light, having reflected light. Who could have mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago that the light of the moon was not its own light, but it was a reflected light, but it was a borrowed light? Again, the atheist may say, maybe your prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a very intelligent person. Don't argue with him. Continue. When I was in school, I passed my school in 1982. I had learned that the sun was stationary. It did not rotate about its own axis. Is that what is mentioned in the Quran? I said, no, this is what I learned in school. I learned in school that the sun was stationary. It did not rotate about its own axis. But the Quran mentions in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33, It is Allah who has created the day and the night. The sun and the moon. Each one traveling in an orbit with its own motion. The Arabic word yes, bahun describes the motion of a moving body and it says that the sun, besides revolving, it even rotates about its own axis. And today science tells us, with the help of an equipment, we can have the image of the sun on the tabletop and the sun has got black spots and it takes approximately 25 days for these black spots to complete one rotation, indicating that the sun takes 25 days to complete one rotation. Who could have mentioned this? What I learned in school 23 years back, now the science says it is wrong. And the Quran has mentioned this 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran? The atheist may give a long pause. Don't wait for the reply. You can keep on continuing. Today, scientists tell us that our universe is expanding. The same message is given in the Quran 1400 years ago. In Surah Dhariyat, chapter number 51, verse number 47, that we have created the vastness of space, the expanding universe. In the field of hydrology, it was Sir Bernard Palissy in 1580 who was the first person who described the present water cycle which we learned in school. Previously, we did not know about the water cycle. The first person was Sir Bernard Palissy in 1580 that he described that the water evaporates from the ocean, forms into clouds, it moves into the interior, it falls down as rain, and the water table is replenished. Now, this water cycle is described in the Quran in great detail in several places. In Surah Zumur chapter 39, verse 21, in Surah Rum chapter number 30, verse number 24, in Surah Mu'minun chapter number 23, verse number 18, in Surah Hijar chapter number 15, verse 22, in Surah Nur chapter number 24, verse 43, in Surah Rum chapter number 30, verse 48, in Surah Raj chapter number 13, verse number 17, in Surah Araf chapter number 7, verse number 57, in Surah Furqan chapter number 25, verse 48 to 49, in Surah Fatir chapter 35, verse number 9, in Surah Qaf chapter number 50, verse number 9, in 11, in Surah Waqiyah chapter 56, verse 68 to 70, in Surah Mulk chapter 67, verse number 30, in Surah Tariq chapter number 86, verse number 11. You can keep on giving references only of water cycle mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. The Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail. You can talk for several minutes on each verse, talking about water cycle. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 14 years ago? And the atheists would be silent. Keep on. There are several scientific facts mentioned in the Quran. The Quran speaks about geology. Today, science tells us that the mountains give stability to the earth. If the mountains were not there, the earth would shake. The Quran says in Surah Naba, chapter number 78, verse number 6 and 7, that we have created the earth as an expanse, while Jabala Autada, and the mountains as stakes. Today, science tells us that the portion of the mountain we see above the ground is a very small portion. The major portion is deep within the ground. Like how when you put a tent peg in the ground, small portion remains on top, the major portion goes down. And these roots of the mountain, they give stability to the earth. The Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 31, that we have created the mountain standing firm on the earth lest it would shake with you. In the field of oceanology, 
We knew previously that there were two types of water, salt and sweet. But we did not know that why these two water did not mix. Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 53, that it is Allah who has created two bodies of flowing water, one sweet and the other salty. Though they meet, they do not mix. There is a barrier between them which is forbidden to be trespassed. Today, after science advanced, we have come to know that though one type of water flows into the other type of water, it loses its constituents and gets homogenized into the water it flows. This homogenizing area, the Quran refers to as barzakh, an unseen barrier, which science has discovered today. And Quran has mentioned 1400 years ago. In the field of biology, the Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّا شَيْنْ هَيْ We have created every living thing from water. Who could have believed 1400 years ago that every living creature is made of water? Today, science has confirmed that everything is made from water. Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 45, we have created every animal from water. Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 54, we have created every human being from water. In the field of botany, Quran says that even the plants have got sexes, male and female. In Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse 53, which we came to know recently. Quran says that every kind of fruits are created in pairs. In Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 3. In the field of zoology, Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the animals in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 38. Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the bees in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse 68 and 69. Quran speaks about the spider in Surah Ankabut, chapter 29, verse 41. About the ant in Surah Namal, chapter number 27, verse number 70 to 18. And all these aspects of the spider, of the ants, of the bees, we have come to know recently and Quran mentions in detail 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned this? Quran speaks about medicine, that in the honey there is healing for humankind. In Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 68 to 69. Quran speaks about the production of milk and the circulation of blood. In Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 66, and Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse 21, 1400 years ago, which we have come to know recently. Quran speaks about medicine, about physiology, about embryology. The various stages of the human development is described in detail in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 12 to 14. Quran speaks about genetics, about the sex responsible for the child in Surah Najm, chapter number 53, verse number 45. Quran speaks about the fingerprinting method in Surah Qiyamah, chapter number 75, verse number 3 and 4. After every scientific fact mentioned in the Quran, ask the atheist who could have mentioned this in the Quran 1400 years ago. And his reply would be the creator, the manufacturer, the maker, the inventor. This creator, this manufacturer, this maker, this inventor, we Muslims, we call him as Allah. Even to an atheist, we can prove about the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the help of the last and final revelation, the glorious Quran. We are not using science to prove Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The science is the yardstick of the atheist. Our yardstick is the Quran. We are using our yardstick and comparing with his yardstick and trying to prove that our yardstick, the glorious Quran, is far superior to your science. So these type of non-Muslims do dawah based on the similarities. If he thinks science is ultimate, we use science and try and get science and the commonalities in the Quran and try to get him closer to Islam. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nahal, Chapter number 16, verse number 125. Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. We have to dawah with hikmah and with husna. Today, the times have changed. Especially after 9-11, we find that the Muslims are on the receiving end. There is virulent propaganda about Islam on the international media, whether it be the international newspapers, the international magazines, the radio broadcast stations, the television channels, there is virulent propaganda about Islam. They are bombarding people with misinformation about Islam. It's the duty of every Muslim that he tries to remove these misconceptions. There are various styles of doing dawah. The most commonly used is that you speak a thousand good things about Islam to a non-Muslim. 
even if you speak a thousand good points about Islam to a non-Muslim, and even if he agrees with those thousand points, yet at the back of his mind he'll think, ah, you are the same Muslim who's a terrorist. Ah, you are a fundamentalist. Ah, you are the same Muslim who marry more than one woman. Ah, you are the Muslims who subjugate the woman by keeping her behind the veil. These few negative points at the back of the mind will prevent the non-Muslim from accepting the beauty of Islam. What I personally prefer, that whenever I meet a non-Muslim, I ask him up front, what do you feel is wrong with Islam? With your limited knowledge, whether right or wrong, what do you feel is wrong with Islam? And I make him comfortable. You can ask any question on Islam, you can criticize Islam, you can attack Islam. I will try my level best to reply. And in the experience that I have of more than a decade in the field of Dawah, I have come to know that there are about 20 common questions which the non-Muslims have regarding Islam. And when they ask you three or four questions, invariably it falls amongst these 20 common questions. So if you know the reply to these 20 common questions asked by the non-Muslims, based on Quran, Hadith and their scripture, with reason, logic and science, even if you cannot convert him, at least you can neutralize him. You can remove the animosity which is there in his heart. I've written a book called The Replies to the Questions Asked by the Non-Muslims. And these questions arise depending upon how the media portrays Islam. And today, the number one question is regarding the Islamic word Jihad. It was number five on the list previously. After 9-11, it became top of the charts. The others have come behind, but it's yet there. Time will not permit me to reply to all these. Inshallah, in tomorrow's talk, I will deal more with this topic about terrorists, about fundamentalists, about extremists, etc. in detail. I'll just tell you how to reply to the top of the charts. That is jihad. As far as this word jihad is concerned, there is not only a misconception among the non-Muslims, there's even a misconception among the Muslims. Most of the people think that any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether it be personal gain, whether it be for power, whether it be for money, it is called as jihad. Jihad does not mean any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether it be for his personal gain, for personal money, for power. Jihad comes from the Arabic word jihada, which means to strive, which means to struggle. In Islamic context, it means to strive and struggle against one's own evil inclination. Jihad also means to strive and struggle to make the society better. Jihad also means to strive and struggle in the battlefield in self-defense. Jihad also means to strive and struggle against oppression. So jihad basically means to strive and struggle. Many non-Muslims, mainly the Orientalists, they translate the Arabic word jihad as holy war. And unfortunately, many so-called Muslim scholars in inverted commas, even they translate jihad as holy war. In Arabic, if you translate holy war into Arabic, it would be harbu muqaddasa. And if you read the Quran, nowhere is the word harbu muqaddasa mentioned in the Quran, neither it is mentioned in the Hadith. So jihad does not mean holy war. Holy war was first used to describe the crusades with the Christians. They killed tens and thousands of human beings in the name of religion. That holy war was used to describe the crusades. Unfortunately, today it is used to describe jihad which is totally a mistranslation. Jihad basically means to strive and means to struggle. One type of jihad can be kital, that is fighting, which is kital fi sabilillah, fighting in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that too has got various rules and regulations, which you can refer to my video cassette, Jihad and Terrorism and Islamic Perspective, which I've dealt in detail about this. And I'll just give an example how to do dawah. Last year, I had gone to States. Last year, year before last, I had gone to States in Los Angeles. And traveling, alhamdulillah, mashallah, different parts of the world in various countries, including the Western countries several times, USA, Canada, Australia, and other parts. I was prepared the way I'm dressed up with a cap, with a beard, with a coat. I was sure that in the US customs, I'll be asked for interrogation. So as I went to the immigration, they asked me the question that, why have you come here? So I said that I've come here to receive an award. 
Jackie, what award? I said, award in service of humanity. Said, what do you do? I said, I spread truth. Jesus Christ, please be able to speak the truth and truth shall free you. And after asking many questions, I see to it that I pick up every opportunity to Dawa. While going to the customs, I purposely mentioned that I've come for a convention, like I came this time, and I've come to receive an award. So they asked me, okay, go and open your bag. When they opened my bag, they saw a tape of mine, a videotape, that time videotape I taken, Jihad and Terrorism. <laughs> so the custom officer, he asked me, that do you believe in Jihad? I said, yes, I believe in Jihad. Jihad means to strive and struggle. Jesus Christ, peace be upon believing in Jihad. He said, no, no, I'm talking about do you believe in fighting? I said, yes, even Jesus Christ, peace be upon believing in fighting. If you read the Bible in the Old Testament, book of Exodus, chapter number 22, it speaks about fighting. Book of Exodus, chapter number 32, speaks about fighting. Book of Numbers, chapter number 31, speaks about fighting. Jesus Christ, peace be upon mentioned in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 22. He said that take the sword and go and fight. So they said, but that was fighting against the evil. I said, yes, that's what the Quran says too. We have to fight against the evil. And in this way, when I started doing dawah, the custom officers all gathered together and there was a small mini lecture. I only told my host that, don't worry, I'm just doing dawah in the immigration and the customs. And sir, can we ask you one more question? Sir, can we ask you one more question? And to cut the story short, you should grab every opportunity and you should try and turn the tables over give the answer which he expects the least. But I don't want everyone to do that, otherwise they may get into problems. As far as dealing on the higher level where to turn the tables over, you have to be careful, otherwise you get into problems, and they say, okay, Dr. Zakinai told me that. Depending upon the situation, you can prove from the Bible that what they attack about the Quran. The same thing is mentioned in the Bible. When I'm in India, I use a different strategy. The master key is the same, but I speak about Bhagavad Gita, I speak about Mahabharat. When the Hindus say that the Quran is wrong, it speaks about fighting, I tell them that there are more verses of fighting in Mahabharat than the Quran. But then they tell me, no, but this is a war between truth and falsehood. I said, same as what the Quran says. It is a war between the truth and falsehood. Then the Hindus tell me we have got no problem with the Quran. And if you read Bhagavad Gita, which is the most popular scripture of the Hindus, in chapter number one, verse number 43 to 46, Arjun, there's a fight between the cousins, the Pandavas and the Kauravas. Pandavas are five brothers, Kauravas are total 100 brothers. So Arjun, one of the Pandavas, in the battlefield, he puts his weapons on the battlefield, on the ground. And he says to Sri Krishna, who is God of the Hindus, he tells to Sri Krishna, I would prefer being killed unarmed rather than to fight against my cousin. Immediately next few verse, chapter number two, verse number two and three, Sri Krishna, who's supposed to be the God, he tells Arjun, how could such impurities come in your heart? How could you be so important? He calls him important. And further, Bhagavad Gita chapter two, verse number 31 onwards, he says, it is the duty of the Kshatriya to fight. If you don't fight, you will not go to the heavenly planet. It will take you away from the heavenly planet. And blessed are those Kshatriyas who get an opportunity to fight. And most of the critics of Islam, they point out a common hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi of Sahih Bukhari, poem number four, in the book of Jihad, hadith number 46, where Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said that if a Mujahid goes to the battlefield, if he's killed, he will get Jannah, he'll go to heaven. If he comes back alive, he will get the booty of this world. He'll get the wealth of this world. And many critics, whether Christian, Hindus, they point this hadith and say, what kind of religion is this? It's talking about jihad, fighting, and you go to heaven. What kind of religion is this? I tell the Hindus that if you read Bhagavad Gita, chapter number two, verse number 37, Sri Krishna tells Arjun that, oh Arjun, rise and fight. If you're killed, you will go to Swarg, heavenly planets. If you come back alive, you would get the wealth of this world. It is the verbatim translation of Sahih Bukhari, volume four, hadith number 46. So when these critics of Islam, especially the Hindus, like Arun Shuri, I wonder that they haven't read those scriptures and they're pointing all in the Quran. The moment you give the context, 
and speak to them, the complete misconception is washed away. Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa im bayna baynakum. Come to common terms as we ascend you. So it's the duty of every Muslim that he conveys the message of Islam to the non-Muslims. Dawa is fard. But unfortunately today, we Muslims, we give excuses for not doing the job. When we tell them, why don't you do dawa? They say, inshallah, when we get the knowledge, we start doing dawa. The time will never come. If you think you'll wait till you become like Sheikh Dida, and then start doing dawa, the time will never come. Our beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, balligu anni walaw aya. Propagate even if you know one verse. Even if you know one verse about Islam, as long as you know it correctly, you have to do your job. At least the Muslims know there is one God. At least tell that. You know about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the messenger. He's the last and final messenger of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. At least tell that. If they ask you the question, how do you prove it? If you don't know, come back and do your homework. I've given the talk on is the Quran God for proving that it's Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. I've given the talk on Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the various world religious scriptures. Come home and do your homework. In this way, Inshallah, Allah will help you and you'll be able to convey the message of Islam. Some Muslims come and tell me, the brother Zakir, first we want to make the Musalman pakka Musalman. We want to make the Muslims practicing Muslims and then we'll do dawah to the non-Muslims. I say the time will never come. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he himself could not convince his own uncle. Do you think you're better than the Prophet? In the farewell pilgrimage, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told the Sahabas, there were 110,000 Sahabas, that did I deliver the message to you? And all of them said, Beshak, yes, verily you have done it. The Prophet told them that all those who are present here, deliver the message to those who are not present here. And out of 110,000 Sahaba, more than 100,000 Sahabas, they were buried outside the Arab land. Doing what? Making Musliman pakka Musliman, making Muslims practice Muslims. They went to do Dawah. In Medina, there were Muslims who did not come for the compulsory congregation salah, did not come for the Juma salah. The Prophet said he felt like burning their homes. Yet, he sent messengers to the king of Abyssinia, king of Persia, king of Yemen, asking them to accept Islam. He did not say, first I'll make all the Muslim, 100% practicing Muslim, and then do dawah. Doing dawah is part on every Muslim. It's compulsory. But many of the Muslims tell me that when we start doing dawah to the non-Muslims, they tell us to mind your own business. I tell them, if any non-Muslim tells me to mind my business, I will say that's what I'm doing. It's the duty of every Muslim to mind other person's business as far as deen is concerned. So by doing dawah, I'm minding my business. That is my business. It is the business of every Muslim to mind other person's business as far as deen is concerned. It is fard on every Muslim to convey the message of Islam. And one of the criteria to go to Jannah, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, where Allah says, Wal asr, innal insan la fi khusr, illa lazin amunu, wa amilu salihati, wa tawasaw bil haqq, wa tawasaw bil sabr. By the token of time, man is well in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who have righteous deeds, those who exhort people to truth, that is to dawah, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. For any human being to go to Jannah, minimum four criteria are required. Iman, righteous deeds, dawah, and exhorting people to patience and perseverance. If any one of these are missing, you shall not enter Jannah. You may be a very good Muslim, you may be offering five times salah, you may have gone for hajj, but if you don't do dawah, you shall not enter Jannah. Only dawah is also not sufficient, all four are equally important. Iman, righteous deeds, dawah, and exhorting people to patience and perseverance. If you do not do dawah under normal circumstances, you shall not enter Jannah. If Allah wants to forgive you and put you in Jannah, that's his business. As Allah says in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 116, and verse number 48, that Allah will never forgive the sin of shirk. Any other sin, if he pleases, he may forgive you. So if you don't do dawah and Allah wants to forgive you, that's a different question. But under normal circumstances, according to Surah Al-Asr, if you don't do dawah, you shall not enter Jannah. And especially to those Muslims who are living in a non-Muslim society. It's an awwal fard. It's compulsory for every Muslim to convey the message of Islam to the non-Muslim. And Allah says in the Quran, in no less than three different places, 
in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 33. In Surah Fatah, chapter number 48, verse number 28. And Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 9, Allah says, Huwa allazi arsala rasul hu bil huda wa din al-haq li wuzira wa ala din kulli wa la qadil mushikun. Allah has sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other religions, over all the other isms, over all the other ways of life, whether it be Christianism, whether it be Judaism, whether it be Hinduism, whether it be Buddhism, whether it be communism, whether it be atheism. Islam is destined to supersede all. Kulli, master them all. Wa la qadil mushikun. How much the mushrik don't like it. And enough is Allah as a witness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised that his deen will prevail, will supersede all the other ways of life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not require you and me the rubbish that we are. Allah himself is sufficient to make his deen prevail. He does not require you and me the rubbish that we are. He is giving us an opportunity to do a prophet's job and do on a prophet's reward. I would like to end my talk by giving the quotation of the glorious Quran from Surah Fusilat. Chapter number 41, verse number 33, which says, Woman ahasunu kaula mim man doil allahi wa amilu saliho wa kaula inna nimil muslimin. Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, works righteousness, and says that I'm a Muslim? Wa akhru dawan alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.